Today's reading is from Genesis 11, 1 to 9, and Revelation uh, chapter 7, 9 to 10. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, If as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Revelation 7, 9-10 to After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. This is the word of the Lord. Well, morning everyone, and uh, welcome to Trinity Morningside Online. And uh, let me add my welcome to Ed. It's great to have you with us. Let me pray and ask God to help us. Father God, we thank you that you are a speaking God. We thank you that you are a sovereign speaking God. You have a plan for the universe. You have a plan for each one of us. And you have a plan to bring all things together under Christ. Lord, help us to see something of the glory of your church today as we begin this new series. And for the glory of the leader of that church, we pray. Amen. What is, what is it that you've come to or you, you, you're being at this morning? Uh, what is it you're a part of? What is church? Um, if you're not used to coming to church, uh, it's great to have you. Uh, what do you think? What do you think you've come to? What, what do you think you are watching? What do you think church is? You know, when most people walk in here to the building I'm in, they usually say something like, "Oh, what a lovely church!" By which they mean, "What a lovely building!" Um, and if they're kind of young and hip, they'll say, "Oh, it's, you know, it's mid-century modern. It's you know, some nice beams or whatever it is." Um, if you were playing a word association game and the word church came up, I think much of our culture's automatic response, the first word they would come up with, would, would be building, right? Perhaps other words as well, boring, old-fashioned, whatever it may be. And some people might say, no, 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 the church is, the church is not the building, the church is the people. And, and they'd be quite right, that's a good start. But you could also add, you know, it's not a massively impressive group of people, some actually quite odd, uh, in fact, the church often attracts odd people, um, as you can see. Uh, and on top of that, sometimes people, uh, the people in the church are, are not the nicest people. You know, a lot of people who are not uh, Christians, uh, I have conversations with, most of them will have a story of, of how they've been put off church in some way by someone in it. Uh, they felt judged or looked down on in some way. So I wonder whether the church, uh, sorry, whether the world, and perhaps you, have a fairly negative view of the church. And I wonder whether that negative view of the church kind of leaks into the church itself. So we end up being a little bit embarrassed about the church, having a sort of uh, fairly negative view of the church. Now, COVID time, this sort of lockdown time, has raised the, the question, hasn't it? What is the church? Uh, do we need to do we need to meet in person in order for it to be the church? We all, most people have been doing church online for quite a while, um, so does that mean I can just do church at home on my own, you know, without other people? Is that is that me being the church, doing the church? 
Now, what we're hoping to do in this series is, is to reset our thinking and our understanding about the church. The Bible is going to give us some other words to associate. So if we were to play a word association game, uh, and the Bible would give us other words like family, <clears throat> body, gathering, city on a hill, bride. And we're praying that, that this, series, this series will reset our, our love for the church and our joy at being the church. Uh, and what I'm hoping for us to do this morning is to, is to really lift our heads out of, out of this church, this kind of group of people, and see that we are part of something so much bigger. Uh, we were hiking in the Berg uh, last weekend and, you know, if you're hiking, you've got to make sure you look down, you've got to, you, know, you don't want to trip over stuff, over stones, over snakes and stuff like that. Well, you actually did see a snake uh, when we were there. But it would be a pretty miserable hike, wouldn't it, if you only looked down the whole way. You'd have no sense of perspective as to where you're heading. You would have no kind of joy of looking back at where you've been, the view and all of that. And you'd get pretty hacked off, wouldn't you, quickly with the blisters, your you know, friends humming, your, your backpack, the weight. And, you know, you've got, you've got to look around to know that it's worth it. And I'm hoping for us to do a similar thing today. We're going to look behind us at the backstory of the church. We'll see where we've come from. And, and we're going to be looking ahead to the trajectory of where we're going. All of which will help us with where we are now. With some of the, the blisters, some of the discomfort perhaps of church. Um, and some of the kind of energy we need to, to get off the couch and, and get going. Uh, again, all with COVID precautions of course. So, the looking down into this church, seeing what this is, the blisters, all of that, um, we, we are hoping to put that into perspective. So we're going to see that we're, we're part of something huge, something that started at the beginning of time, and something that will continue into eternity. So the backstory of the church, how did that church come to be, um, the, the future, but also the here and now. I'm not going to touch too much on the future because it's so important, we've, we've given a whole week over to it later, later on. So past, present, and future. So number one, the backstory of the church. In other words, how did the church come about? So if you've uh, read any um, Dan Brown books, it's quite old now, but any Dan Brown books, one of his uh, specialities was to claim that the church came about in the third century by a chap called Constantine. Uh, Constantine decided it would be good for the Roman Empire to be a Christian empire. So that's where the, ch the church started. Uh, that's not the case. The church didn't start with Constantine, it started with Christ. But the backstory goes way, way further back to the Garden of Eden. The story of the church, God's people, is really the story of the Bible. And the story of the Bible is really, is really a story of gathering, in other words, God's grace, kindness to his people, bringing them in, and a story of, of scattering. In other words, God's judgment, God sending his people away. Um, that may be a surprise to you that's to sort of sum up the story of the Bible like that, but, but hopefully you'll see what I mean. So let's start at the beginning. Gathered in Eden, scattered at Babel. Now, uh, don't worry if these, if these names don't mean anything to you. Um, so when God created the world, he created man and woman to care for it. He didn't say, okay, Adam, you go like over the, to the east, uh, Eve, you go to the west. Uh, you sort of sort the world out there and then come back and I'll see you in a thousand years. They lived together, God and his people, his people and their God, and his people and each other, in this case in marriage, they lived together. Um, they were gathered, in, although it's small scale of course, they were gathered together. God didn't scatter them across the world, he gathered them to himself. And gathered together around God, enjoying His presence and living under His word. That was basically the first church. Um, and their, their mission strategy was different to ours. Their mission strategy was to have lots of babies. Um, although that is part of our mission strategy as well. Um, of course it didn't remain like this for long. Um, Adam and Eve decided not to live under God's word. They pushed Him to one side. They listened to the serpent instead. What did God do? He scattered them. He banished them from the Garden of Eden. And outside the Garden, they continued to grow. Uh, they grew in number, but they also grew in sinfulness. 
And that's when we get to the Tower of Babel. Um, so have a look at Genesis chapter 11. Here we see mankind not being gathered together by God, but gathering themselves together to make a name for themselves without God. So look at uh, verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That's why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Did you notice in verse 4 that they knew being scattered was a bad thing? Uh, they want to build a city to prevent from being scattered. And we might love the idea of being scattered. You know, a little bit of peace and quiet, sort of family in the uh, farm in the Karoo. Um, in those days, being scattered meant you, you lost power, you lost security, you lost economic potential. Scattering was, was bad for you. And that's why God judges their pride and their arrogance. Basically, they were saying, we, we don't need God. Look how uh, advanced, look how great we are. And he judges that attitude by confusing their languages and scattering them across the earth, rendering them powerless and therefore more humble. So the people God gathered to himself in creation, having multiplied, have been scattered out from Eden and out across the whole earth. Remember, gathering equals grace, scattering equals judgment. So it doesn't look good. But then right in the next chapter, uh, there's a promise of gathering. Do you see it there? Chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's house, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. In other words, through you, I will gather a people for myself. A people who will enjoy my presence and live under my word. Like the Garden of Eden, but different. Now, if you've been a Christian a while, you'll know that God is a God who keeps his promises. Um, what, he says he, what he says he will do, he will do. Um, the promise to Abraham is, is no exception. He makes him into a great nation. So Abraham has a son called Isaac. Isaac has a son called uh, Jacob. I'll step for a second. Uh, Jacob has 12 sons and they become the people of Israel. In fact, as a group of 70 in their family, they go into Egypt and then become enslaved. When they leave Egypt, they're a group of, a, of over a million, over a million people. And after breaking them out of Egypt with miracles and power, God gathers that million people together at a place called Mount Sinai. And it's there that he, he makes them or constitutes them into the nation of Israel, the nation that he promised Abraham you would make him into. So they are gathered at Sinai, scattered into Babylon. Actually, this was the whole reason God rescued them out of slavery in Egypt, so that they would gather together and worship him in the desert. Um, and they stayed together at the mountain for about, for about two years, enjoying God's presence, or rather experiencing God's presence. They didn't really enjoy it. They were too scared of the kind of awesome, um, awesome presence of God on the mountain to enjoy it particularly, but they experienced it and they lived under God's word. Of course, they might be the nation that God has promised, uh, but they're not in the land that God has promised. And so they wander around the desert. When they finally get to the edge of the promised land, and Moses gives them a pep talk uh, found in the book of Deuteronomy about how to best live in the land God has given them. And at the end, he basically lays out the covenant and he sort of says, well, look, if you obey God, then this, this and this will happen. If you don't obey God, then this, this, and this will happen. Uh, and this is one of the things he says will happen 
if they don't obey God. This is Deuteronomy 28. Then the Lord will scatter you among all nations, from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. In other words, God is gathering his people into a land that he's given them. He's given them a law to follow. If they don't keep that law, his gathered people will once again be a scattered people. But surely they'll keep the law, right? Surely this time when they go in the land, they'll, they'll keep the law. It makes sense. Surely they will. Well, God's gathered people, they do go into the land. They settle down and for a life. Uh, for a while, life is, life is great. Uh, you know, there's fruit, there's abundance, there's prosperity, there's, there's victory. It's, you know, it's a great kingdom. But then they gradually turn away from God and they do end up worshipping other gods instead of the true God. And, and God, you know, um, <laughs> you need to know God is not just faithful in, in keeping his promises of salvation. He is also faithful in keeping his promises of judgment. He mobilizes the countries around them, Babylon, Assyria to the north, uh, and they take Israel off into what the Bible calls the exile. In other words, God's, God's gathered people into this land have now been scattered again out of it. This is how Jeremiah, one of the prophets, puts it, Jeremiah 50. Israel is a scattered flock that lions have chased away. The first to devour them was the king of Assyria. The last to crush their bones was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And that's an, that's an image we understand in South Africa, isn't it? Lions scattering a flock or a herd and kind of crunching down on bones. So God's people who were gathered in the Garden of Eden to enjoy God's presence, live under his word, they sinned, they were scattered across the earth, but in his grace, God gathered them to himself again to enjoy his presence and live under his word or his law. But again, they sinned against him and chose other gods. So again, God scatters them among the nations. Now, you might think, right, that God, um, God would lose his patience with this, with this people. Surely if, if you were God or I were God, we would like be, I don't know, let's just start again with a new group of people. It makes sense. But, but God's not like that. He doesn't do that. While they are scattered in exile, God sends them prophets, uh, people he, he, he sends to give them messages, prophets, to basically say, look, sit tight. It, it doesn't look good now, and that's on you. But God, God hasn't given up on us. God will gather us again. He's not finished with us yet. Yes, you've sinned. Yes, you've chosen other gods. Yes, we've scattered because of that. But God's grace and salvation is bigger than that. And just as an aside, I wonder if that's a, I wonder if that's a, a truth you, you really need to hear this morning. That yes, our sin is, is big. And you will know your own sin. I know mine. But God's mercy and grace is bigger and greater than that. I've been listening to a song recently and the chorus tagline is um, his, uh, Our sins they are many, his mercy is more. He will gather us again, said, say the prophets to Israel in exile. The three heavyweights put it like this, Isaiah 11. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Uh, Jeremiah 31, hear the word of the Lord, you nations, proclaim it in distant persons. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. Ezekiel 11, therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you back the land of Israel again. That's what he promised. Is that what he does? Does he gather them again? Yeah, I guess and after about 70 years, after the exile, a whole crowd of Jews are permitted to return to Jerusalem. They start getting everything back the way it was, except, except they can't quite, right? The temple they build is really nothing like the one they had before. Um, something that the older generation point out, um, as, as only an older generation perhaps can. You know, they just don't build, they don't build temples and cities like they used to, and, which was true. It wasn't as glorious. The city itself is, is not nearly as secure or beautiful. So there's a, you know, there's a kind of gathering again, but it's a little bit half-hearted. Actually, it might not seem like it to us, but do you know what the next significant gathering was? The next significant gathering was, was when a first century Galilean, 
walked along the Sea of Galilee and said to twelve fishermen, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And that was the beginning of, of God's movement in Israel. And the movement grows and grows. People see the amazing things Jesus did. He, he you know, turns water into wine. He, he walks the water. He, he, he turns bread into uh, tons of bread for everyone. And, and also the things he said. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to me. Gather to me. So they gather around him. They enjoy his presence. They listen to his words. And the movement grows and grows. But then Jesus dies. And his followers don't know what to do. They, they, they meet together in a room. They're, they're scared. They're weak. They're clueless. And then there's a, sudden, there's a sudden sound of rushing wind in the room. Fire comes on and lands on each of them. They go outside to a busy Jerusalem. And they start preaching the message of a risen Savior. In the power of the Spirit. The movement lives on. It keeps going. Gathered at Pentecost, scattered into the world. So have a look at Acts chapter 2 and think back to the scattering of Babel. So Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, gathered. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya near Cyrene, the visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Can you see what's happening? So what's happening is a complete reversible so a complete reversal of the judgment of Babel. Remember in his judgment, God scattered people into different language groups across the earth. Here in God's grace, every nation under heaven is gathered together. People from every nation under heaven are gathered together and somehow able to understand what's being said. And what's being said is that Jesus is God's king. He has come to rescue us from our sin. Put us back in the right with God and gather us under Jesus in the new creation. That's essentially the message of, of, of Christianity. And, and the result of this, verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added, gathered to their number that day. Uh, verse 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In other words, through these guys, these apostles, God had begun gathering his people together on a permanent basis. Actually, what's happening is all of that, all of those things that the heavyweight prophets were saying is coming true. And, and more, because it's not just Israel, right? God is gathering uh, people together from every nation. He's got a new people in Jerusalem and he's adding to their number every day. But tragedy, one of the disciples, Stephen, gets killed. Um, and at chapter 8, verse 1 happens. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. But this time, scattering doesn't equal judgment. There's a reason for this scattering, and it's there in verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They were scattered over the earth, not in God's judgment, but in God's mission. As they were scattered, they gathered. They gathered people into God's kingdom. And they gathered themselves into smaller gatherings to keep each other going, to, to each you know, enjoy God's presence in the Spirit and to listen, live under His word, the apostles' teaching. And you know what those small gatherings scattered across the earth are called? They're called churches. And that's where we are now. 
Right? That's the here and now of the church. So the backstory was God's people gathered in Eden, scattered in Babel. Gathered at Sinai, scattered into Babylon. Gathered through Jesus at Pentecost, but then scattered across the world. And that's where we are now. Those Christians were scattered from Jerusalem. They set up churches and they gathered people into those churches, into God's kingdom. And they eventually went up into Europe. They went down into North Africa and they just kept, kept going down, kind of via Europe, until they got to Durban. And many years later, here we are, Trinity Church Morningside. Now that's a pretty rough version of the backstory, but we need to know the backstory as we gather here on a Sunday, because it tells us two things. It tells us what we are and what we do. See, what we are. It tells us, if nothing else, what this is, is, is not a random thing we do on a Sunday morning because it's something we've always done. It's part of a huge story, a global cosmic story. And in terms of what we are, I mean, we've said it already, but how many times were buildings or places of worship mentioned in the backstory? None. How many times were people mentioned? Lots and lots and lots. So it's obvious, but we have to get this. Church is not something you go to, it's something you are. We're not church for one hour a week. We're church all the time. We're a community of people who have been gathered with Jesus in common. That doesn't change when we walk through those doors or when we kind of get up off our couch, wherever we may be. Church is not something you go to, it's something you are. It's also not optional. Um, I'm not talking about this Sunday gathering or you know this church even, but being part of the church wider. You know, to say I'm a Christian but I'm not part of the church doesn't make sense because you are. If you're a Christian, you've been gathered to Jesus. Christ has taken your sin on himself. He has made you perfect and he's gathered you to himself and therefore he's gathered you to all the other people he's gathering to himself. If you're a Christian, consider yourself gathered. It's not optional. It also helps us with what this is. See, the Christians in Jerusalem were scattered across the earth. Christians are still scattered across the earth. Peter, in his letter, calls us uh, scattered exiles. There is no one conference or like mass church service for all the Christians in the world. That would be pretty hectic. I think COVID protocols would be pretty tricky to enforce that. So that's not the case. There, there are though thousands and thousands, millions perhaps, of smaller gatherings and sub-communities. There's one big church that everyone, every Christian is a part of, and there are thousands of sub-churches that they're also a part of. Trinity is one of those. There will be a day, where, though, when, when the big church, in other words, every single Christian in the world, will gather together. In fact, that's what the world is heading towards. Ephesians 1.10 says, When the times will have reached their fulfillment, God will bring all things together under one head. That is Christ. But until that day, we keep meeting together in our sub-churches. Like a model car, I guess. You know you have a model car. It tells you what a real car uh, or, or a bigger version of that car looks like. It has some of the same functions. It shows you what it does. Well, in the same way, that's us. And every other Christian church. We're model churches of the real big one. The one that will gather together when times will have reached their fulfillment. And actually the one that is already happening in some way, right now in heaven. We are small microcosms of that much bigger uh, heavenly reality. Puts us in perspective, doesn't it? The backstory shows us we're a people scattered but gathered at the same time. The backstory also shows us what we do. I don't know if you noticed, each gathering we looked at had the same two uh, components, right? They enjoyed or experienced God's presence with them, and they lived and listened uh, to His Word, lived under His Word. Garden of Eden, they enjoyed God's presence, lived under His Word for a while. Mount Sinai, they experienced God's awesome holy presence, lived under His Word. With Jesus, the twelve were experiencing the most uh, real way possible, in the most real way possible, God's presence with them. And they listened to God's words in the most direct way. 
At Pentecost, they experienced God's presence and the Holy Spirit lived under his word. And us, we scattered across the world, we continue to enjoy God's presence and live under his word, the Bible. So we are people who the Spirit has taken up residence and he dwells in us, he lives in us, and he helps us uh, read his word and live under Jesus' word. So as a, on a Sunday, if, we, if and when we, we come back to church, uh, we, we come here to enjoy God's presence together in a special way. We come here to listen to, to him speak to us and then as a community, help each other live under that word in the week. Also, we are, or we should be, a gathering gathering. Now I know at the moment that that is very limited in what we can do. But in normal times, we should be a gathering, gathering, a community that gathers. Remember the Christians that were scattered from Jerusalem, they preached the word wherever they went. They gathered other people into their sub-churches. So they should, we, should, we should be a church that reaches out to others and pulls them in. God gathers through us. But you need to know, and this is, let's wrap this up, but you need to know, this is not how the story ends, right? You need to know it's because of the blisters you may be experiencing at the moment, because uh, perhaps church is not what you expected or what you wanted it to be. We need to know the not yet of the church. You know, one of the perks of doing my job is that you go to lots and lots of weddings, uh, which is great. This, is, this has been a lean year for that, I can tell you, but uh, usually great food, great people, great fun, great time to get it. And I, actually, I remember thinking back to our wedding and, and looking around the room and thinking, when do you ever get all your favorite people in the same room together and enjoy time together? And Jesus says in the Bible, the ultimate final gathering of the church at the end of time will be like that. Not actually one really long church service that goes on for eternity, as some people think, but great food, great wine, a great party, ultimately, a wedding. Uh, and that's not even the best bit. You see, who's the bride and who's the groom in this, in this wedding feast? The Bible tells us we are the bride and Jesus. We, the church, are the bride. Jesus is the groom, waiting for her to come down the aisle. Um, I get to see, standing at the front, the, t the twitching bridegroom, um, sometimes an intake of breath as he sees his bride coming down the aisle. But isn't that an amazing thought? Think about that. Jesus feels about the church as a bridegroom feels about his bride. This is how it will go down. After this I looked, Revelation 7, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing, gathered before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And later on they say, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. We are the bride of Christ. And this picture of the bride should tell us how much we're loved and valued. You know, a couple about to get married are usually irritatingly besotted with one another. This picture tells us that Christ is, is besotted with the church. He loves the church. Can you believe that? In all our imperfections and problems and issues and divisions, he, he loves us and he's looking forward to the day when we walk down the aisle dressed in the perfection that he brought us on the cross. That's the trajectory we're on as a church. Now, what is it you've come to this morning? What is it you're watching? Church is not an event on a Sunday morning. I, su I suppose, you know, a Sunday morning, we, I suppose we ought to go to if we've got nothing else to do. We're a people. We're a people Christ has died for. We're a people that Christ loves like a husband loves his bride. And we're part of something huge. This is our story. Um, Bev's mum has been writing her memoirs during lockdown about life in the, on the farm in the free state growing up. And our kids really enjoyed reading it and hearing it. Because in some way, even though it's her story, it's their story. They are connected to it. They're a part of it. They kind of live it on, if you like. We're part of a massive story that started in the Garden of Eden with a couple of people gathered to God and will end at a fantastic wedding feast with a multitude no one can count 
gathered to God. If you're not a Christian this morning, you're out of step with where the world is heading. The church is not an old-fashioned thing that the world has moved on from. The church is central to where the world is going. And please don't think the church is a place to get judged. Really, we are a people who have had sin forgiven and we gather to Jesus because of his grace to us. The question is not to ask, do you belong to a church? The question to ask actually is, do you belong to Jesus? Have you come to him for forgiveness? Do you be- have you, if, you, if you belong to Jesus, you belong to the church. And one day you'll be around the throne in the ultimate wedding feast, enjoying life with him in the new creation. And, and let me say, Christian, as I say to myself, look, if that is how central the church is to God's plans for the world. If that is how Jesus feels about the church, like a bridegroom to his bride, if Jesus gave his life for the church, if the story is ending like this, then shouldn't our attitude to the church reflect that? Church is not something to be embarrassed about, something to sort of have on the side if you you have time for. It's something to celebrate and to serve and glorify God for. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your great plan of salvation. We thank you for the way that we, if we're Christians, fit into that. The way that you have gathered us to yourself. The way you've put your spirit in us so we can enjoy your presence with us. So that we can understand and live under your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the one who uh, will be waiting at the end of the aisle, so to speak. And uh, he will be welcoming us, your church, perfect into the new creation where we will live with him forever. Father, help our our hearts and our attitudes to, to reset when it comes to church. Help us to see the trajectory we're on and to live accordingly. We ask this for the glory of Jesus. Amen.